Welcome back to Black Ops. I'm Emma Gatti and I'm picking up the host chair from the great Ralf Tiller. Black Op is the special web series by Space Watch Global focused on security and defense in space. It's the right place to be if you want to engage in in-depth analysis and discussions about the well-known link between space assets and military operations. It's probably the closest you will ever get to a proper James Bond plot. It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Central Europe, and it is time for another episode of Space Cafe Black Ops by Dr. Emma Gatti. As always, we really appreciate your feedback and participation, and we will learn and prove based on it. I'm Elena, at event coordinator at Spacewatch.global, and Spacewatch.global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keep our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. The latest one features Daniel Lid from the Iceland Space Agency. We also have new exciting episodes of Space Cafe Radio, our, our, our other format, with Kevin O'Connell in our mini-series from the BSSI conference. So don't miss them. Our fun shop is also open for you. It's always open, of course, because it's on our website and it's a nice way for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, don't worry. We have an archive available on our webpage in the event section, and you can also find us on YouTube, of course. With that, my job for today is almost done and enjoy the talk. Emma, over to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a new episode of Black Ops. It's a pleasure to see so many old friends in the audience, but also some new names, someone new to the crowd, and also interesting to see so many degrees, so many different backgrounds. Uh, the new episode of Black Ops brings uh, with itself a surprise. We will have now a fixed guest for the next uh, seven episodes, Dr. Namrata Kozuami. Uh, Namrata, for whoever follows the space geopolitics, is a sort of superstar. She's very well known within the field. But for those of you that, who don't know her, she is an independent scholar teaching and researching space policy, geopolitics, and great power competition. She is also a faculty associate at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at the Arizona State University for the Executive Masters in Global Management Space course. She's as a consultant for Space Fund Intelligence and a guest lecturer at the seminar on India Today, Economics, Politics, Innovation and Sustainability from Emory University. And she's also the author of one of the most compelling book I read so far, and I, a book that I recommend to everyone that is starting uh, the journey into space geopolitics. The name of the book is Scramble for the Skies, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space. Namrata, thank you for being here with me today. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you, Emma, uh, for having me in Space Cafe. And it's it's a pleasure and an honor for me. So fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me explain a bit the public, how we're going to structure quickly our, uh, our chat. So it's going to be more of a dialogue than a, a strict interview. Um, so we have some broad themes and every episode we would like to explore a different nation and to contextualize the geopolitical power of this nation within the space game. Uh, this idea came uh, uh, when Namrat and I met uh, in Prague at the PSSI Security Conference, and together we had this idea to try to put together a series of webinars that could somehow shed the light onto the complex geopolitical space situation using a sort of plain and simple language. So to open the doors to everyone, not only the scholars of um, political science. So we are here to, to discuss ideas, to discuss facts from the news, and to speak about strategic and political tactics. And also obviously to, to take a stock of what's going on in the world, because 
we are experiencing an acceleration of the entire geopolitical scene uh, and we believe that space is a key part of it. So um, what uh, we're going to discuss today, I think the, the theme of the day is a sort of a framework. So try to explore all the various aspects of the discourse and introduce the general rules of the space power uh, game. Uh, so where do we stand today? What does space mean in its, uh, its, its historical period? And how the powers are shifting? And we would like us to bring into the discourse uh, also the most recent uh, news, like such as the 20 Chinese Congress and the recent uh, Bad Administration National Security Strategy. So this is the frame for today. Let's start. Uh, Namrat, uh, Namrata, probably the first question is an uh, introduction to modern space uh, geopolitical theory. So how can we frame the space environment discourse in the 21st century from a geopolitical point of view? Sure, thank you, Emma, for that. And uh, so when you think about space geopolitics, what we are thinking about is how nations are utilizing space in the 21st century, which is different from the 20th century with the end of the Cold War in 1991. And we are also looking at how that particular change in framing is affecting state behavior, not just on Earth, but also out to from low Earth orbit to cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the Moon, and on beyond to Mars and the asteroid belt, right? So when you think about space geopolitics, a term that is used, which was uh, formulated by Dr. Everett Dolman in a book called Astropolitics. So the term that you can also utilize is this concept of astropolitics, astro strategy, by which you mean that uh, in the country's conceptualization of its grand strategy, so grand strategy in short means how a nation utilizes its economic, military, political, narrative power to create influence for itself and its society so that it's able to do much more in the international system. So in the concept of astropolitics, you utilize that not just on Earth, but also in space, right? And so that's how the formulation of space and geopolitics is happening. The second important departure, which I think is not really recognized as much, is that during the Cold War, space was a lot about technological demonstration and going to somewhere in space for a few days and coming back, right? So for example, when you think about the Apollo space program of the US, or including the erstwhile USSR or the Soviet Union space program, it was about showing that you can send humans, for example, to low Earth orbit or to the moon and to bring them back, right? And so it was about technological demonstration, but it also was about showcasing that an ideological superiority exists vis-a-vis -vis space demonstration. And so economic and economic development was not really part of that particular conceptualization. Today, and which I find very exciting, Nations are actually conceptualizing space from a critical infrastructure perspective that human society to function efficiently requires space support and states to function efficiently in regard to their national security, economic development also depends on space support and space is critical. And so you can see the changes from technology, ideology, it's becoming a lot about economic development national security and technology is now seen as a means to an end it's not the end itself i was just writing some note because um so when you speak about ideology uh, you often mention the concept of strategic culture which means that uh, following this this idea how the US looks at space is different from how China looks at space, is different from how Russia looks at space. I know we will have specific episodes discussing US, China, but can you give us an overlook of the meaning of strategic culture and how it's attached to space and the use that we want to do under an economical and political framework? 
Sure. So, uh, so to make it very clear to your audience, when I am talking ideology, what I mean is a particular belief system, right? So it could be a political belief system, it could be a societal belief system. And belief systems are critical because they're connected to the value that you are basically uh, working towards, right? So if you think about the belief systems that exist in the world today in terms of ideology and politics, you have a democratic belief system, right? That Europe, uh, the United States, uh, you know, countries in Africa, uh, countries in Asia have democratic regimes that argue that for a society to achieve a particular level of development, representative democracy through elections is an important belief system, right? And based on that, you have a particular strategic culture. So strategic culture is basically the elites, and this is really important, strategic culture is not conceptualized by everybody, right? It is basically the elites, meaning the policy makers, the military leaders, the uh, in public intellectuals that conceive how a particular episode in geopolitics or in space is an opportunity or it could be a threat, right? And that is influenced by the particular country's strategic culture and political culture. So if you're a democracy, you will also have influences within your strategic culture that do not like militarization of space, right? For example, let me give the example of India, right? So when India first became independent in 1947, to about, I would say 2019, India's proclivity was to view space from a very civilian, peaceful domain, right? So that was the strategic culture because of colonial influence, because of the fear that there could be a subjugation of India if there is militarization of space. India was very much about peaceful use. Space is not about militarization. And that is where India's unique political culture, a multi-diverse society, geopolitically located uh, with China and Pakistan as a border because of nuclear weapons. India was very much about how do you ensure that space is not militarized. But interestingly, a country can also go through a shift in strategic culture, right? So under the Modi government, which is currently in power, India actually tested an anti-satellite weapon in 2019, telling you that India's perception of space as purely a peaceful domain shifted. And India actually created about 350 pieces of debris. But what was insightful for me coming from Northeast India is that when Prime Minister Modi saw that test successful, he tweeted that India has finally become a space power, right? So that is where strategic culture comes in. For Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, strategic culture and a country's uh, sense of its power did not come from such military demonstrations, right? But for Prime Minister Modi, military demonstrations of space power was critical for him to say that only now has India become a space power, right? And then you said about China. So for China too, it's very interesting. Historically, Mao and Deng Xiaoping were also arguing, including Hu Tao, that space is a lot about peaceful development, it's about ensuring that China can contribute to humanity's capability to get to space, right? But that shifted since 2015 with China's military doctrine that it put out. And based on its strategic culture, which is becoming much more about looking at space from a national security perspective and a fear that if you do not develop space militarily, you might lose out, China included space as part of its military domain. So that shows you that there is a shift in its internal strategic culture informed by its own political belief system. And then I'll finally end by saying that over all this is also the international framing of democracy versus authoritarianism, right? So from the Chinese perspective, their one party, Communist Party of China led uh, political regime is uh, fair and legitimate because they argue that they represent the uh, Chinese people, right? And they would argue this is a party 
meritocracy, right? And so if you want to understand China, it is interesting that you can use Western concepts like authoritarianism, but are they using those concepts, right? If you go to China, if you talk to the people, they never use that term. They use the term that this is a party meritocracy, by which they mean that if you have merit, you will get promoted, right? So that is strategic culture. So if you do not understand that they are not using the same terms, you might actually misunderstand their space power and as well as their space ambitions. And so that's how I would frame it. So um, how space becomes important for the political discourse? So space is directly connected to the political discourse today, right? So first of all, uh, countries are starting to designate space as a critical infrastructure, which means they are prioritizing space as a key core component of their political system. They argue that space development directly contributes to the society's resilience, to the state's capability for national security and economic development. Uh, it was not like the Cold War where space was out there somewhere and we are inspired and we hope to get there, right? Today, you have 72 nations with space programs. Think about it. During the Cold War, you had about five nations with space capability. Today, because of satellite communication, uh, launches that are getting cheaper, the articulation of space from a direct connection, for example, one of the connections that Indonesian president made is that without global positioning system, Indonesian society cannot function. You cannot have navigation. You cannot have uh, your container ships coming in efficiently. Uh, you, and without satellite support, you cannot have your ATM financial systems efficient, right? So it's directly connected to the political system. And I would say that when we think political system, it's also important to clarify that, right? We think political system is only about political parties and elections. No, political system is the entire resilience of the society and what kind of uh, market, what kind of economic development, what kind of individual right does that political system support, right? And space is playing a critical role in that and actually democratizing society to a very large extent. So, if we could do an overview of where do we stand today in terms of space power equilibrium. I know we are uh, witnessing a major shift in the distribution of power. Can you frame this for us? Can you show us more or less where are the major changes, what you can observe from above, from a more like geopolitical uh, point of view? Sure. So uh, one of the biggest changes in terms of space equilibrium is the movement away from just Earth orbit to cislunar space and deep space, right? So that's a major shift. So countries are starting to view space just not just about satellite communication, low Earth orbit presence or geosynchronous orbit presence that supports uh, operations, critical society infrastructure on Earth, but they are starting to articulate space from a much larger grand strategic cislunar perspective, right? An example is the recent White House uh, document on cislunar strategy, right? So if you look at that particular document, space is now articulated for economic development, but the Earth-Moon system has become extremely critical in that particular perspective, right? Uh, countries like China, India, Japan, which we will talk about in the episodes coming later, are also looking at space from a much larger grand strategic thinking. The second important change that is happening in terms of space power is that presence in space is now starting to be articulated from a permanent presence concept, right? So during the Cold War, including almost all the programs that were established, the idea of permanent presence was not something that states were articulating, right? But today, when you think about space and the concept of space, countries are starting to articulate developing research bases on the moon, establishing bases on Mars, extracting resources from the asteroid belt. And so you can see that there is a shift in terms of permanent presence. And what is even more interesting to me is that 
that particular shift is then connected to the notion of space power and equilibrium. And equilibrium is critical because if you think about, let's just compare the US and China for a moment to give you an example, right? So the Chinese argument is that they are going to lead in terms of space extraction resource capability, by which they mean that they are developing the robotic capability to extract resources, for example, on the moon, like helium-3 uh, that can develop nuclear fusion, iron ore, water ice, and then uh, resources on the asteroids like platinum, titanium. So their argument is that if you think about where the programs are between the US and China, China is actually jumping the equilibrium because they are they have decided on doing these kind of developments 20 years before the US actually is committing to it, right? So in that context, it's not just about space for military demonstration that can project equilibrium. It's the commercial, the economic development aspect beyond the orbital dynamics of Earth that is creating this uh, challenge to the kind of space equilibrium we think about. And then uh, nations like Japan have joined in now, nations like uh, Luxembourg is joining in, Nigeria, United Arab Emirates, all actually uh, reflecting back this shifting dynamics of equilibrium and what space means. So I'll end by saying that space is not just seen as something where you go and do space science exploration for inspirational purposes, right? That we see Earth from space and we feel that Earth is so vulnerable, right? That discourse was very Cold War when we saw the first picture of Earth from the moon, right? Today, the discourse is about how space includes Earth. Earth is actually very, uh, you know, it's not just vulnerable, it's actually very strong. It survives in that environment. And that space is actually contributing to the country's sense of who they are in terms of who is the leader, in terms of the narrative that is being set in the post-Cold War. And this is being demonstrated by missions uh, that actually prove that they are very serious about achieving permanent presence, including space in the larger astropolitical conceptualization and making it very accessible to their societies. So you will not have elite astronauts, 500 of us, right? You're thinking about millions of people going to space in the next hundred years. That's going to change the game for you. So it's very interesting, like if I can make a comment, uh... Um, we follow all this development also from strictly the economical point of view. And uh, my perception is that the economical discourse is still much strictly attached to Earth, satellites, telecommunication. So it's not so far ahead. So what I'm understanding from what you just say is that there are in a sort of way two different worlds. The economic private sector is still looking pretty much at what they can do with the satellite connection on Earth, while the security and strategy and defense is already shifting the discourse beyond Earth, looking at the moon as a strategic, and the Chis lunar orbit, of course, as a strategic space. This is incredibly interesting if we start to think about the space between us and the moon as a land to conquer. Yes, actually, this is really interesting that you put that in that frame because it helps me to respond uh, in that particular framing. So uh, it is true that till today, the space industry is a lot about satellite communications, right? If you look at the assessments coming out of different reports, including Standard Charter, Citibank, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, the amount of money they talk about, which is about $400 billion today, is about satellite communications, right? Exactly. But yeah. then there are assessments that have been put out in, for example, the RAND 2050 report, including the Citibank report, which is the new space economy that talks about by 2030, you will have a $2 trillion economy, not just from communications, but also because you're going to utilize resources on the moon, right? Like, for example, you can have iron or aluminum, or you can have water ice, right? And build that cislunar uh, economy. I think what is so interesting is that, I think, and that's why I say you have to look at the lead actor who is actually changing the discourse, right? 
And so uh, it's a country in Asia, for example, China and Japan that are changing the discourse, right? So for China, the articulation of the Earth Moon system was viewed from an economic zone perspective. So when they started thinking about cislunar space, they articulate, they don't use the word cislunar, it's a very Western term. They use the term Earth Moon economic zone, right? So think of it, they think of it in terms of zoning and economic development and capability. And I think that has shifted the discourse from just looking at space. And, and you know, Emma, when we talk about communications, we're not really talking about space, we're talking about Earth orbital support, low Earth mm -hmm. orbit, you know, middle earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, right? But you, actually countries are going beyond that. And, and I think, uh, as you said, the moon is becoming critical in this discourse. And so I just recently looking at documents and speeches across the world, I realized that there is also a difference in how the moon is conceptualized, right? From a strategic culture perspective, even the US has a strategic culture, right? And so the strategic culture of will we do expansionist development of the moon or are we going to be ensuring that the moon it maintains its peaceful celestial body concept as per the outer space treaty and is it even legal to be going and mining resources on the moon that's the discourse in the us right yeah absolutely. Japan, has moved, japan has moved ahead so if you look at uh, Japan's uh, recent space mining legislation that they passed in December of 2021, uh, and you should, uh, I mean, I'll urge the audience to go and have a look at that particular legislation. It's available, uh, including in the Library of Congress website. So in that particular legislation, Japan has actually established the uh, permission regime for how a company or a Japanese citizen can get the license to go and extract resources on the moon and can keep it, right? And guess what? Japan became the first country in the world to actually give such a license to the Japanese company iSpace to go to the moon and extract resources. And guess who is buying it from them? NASA. So, <laughs> yes, as a proof of concept. So uh -huh. you can see that this particular strategic culture articulation is shifting in Asia. And I'll finally end by saying that when you think about the moon as a very strategic area of the solar system that we inhabit. So the one difference in terms of how the moon is conceptualized plays into our conversation, right? So I studied the strategic cultures and looked at how societies view the moon. So when you listen to the discourse coming out from the United States, including from the Artemis program, right now we have Artemis one, right? And so the discourse is that the moon is a celestial body that is going to be utilized as a testing ground to go to Mars, right? And so the Artemis is a Greek goddess, as we know, the twin sister of Apollo. The word is not from American lexicon, it's from Europe. Right. And so I noticed that when I talk about Artemis to common American on the street, the connection is not emotive. Right. It's very interesting. And so the moon by itself is not seen as an intrinsic valuable asset. Right. It is seen as where you go, you prove your capability as a spacefaring civilization, and then you use it to go to Mars. Mars is the actual celestial body that uh, at least the elite, remember I told you strategic culture is decided by the elite. The elite in American society has decided that's the path to be and NASA is included in that elite, right? Now think about China or India or Japan. For these countries, the moon is intrinsically valuable for its own sake. They do not connect it to their Mars program, right? So when you listen to, for example, China's lead uh, lunar scientist Wu Wering, uh, he's really brilliant in terms of thinking about how do you explain the value of the moon to the common Chinese citizen, right? And he writes a lot, he gives lots of interviews. His recent interview was published on the Oxford University website. And he argues that no, the moon is something that intrinsically is valuable to China we have societal investment in the concept of the moon goddess, for example, Chang'e, and we have moon festivals. When I went to China, that's what they told me, that if you want to understand the value of the moon from a strategic culture perspective, go to the moon festivals. 
it's all over Chinese society, right? So the value of the moon, its strategic asset is very different. Japan, moon is intrinsically important, right? They're not connecting it to some other program. And that's again where strategic culture comes in. And I think that is what is going to make the difference in terms of which nation actually views it from a strategic perspective, right? So there are certain areas on the moon that are strategic, for example, the South Pole, where the resources are, and then the Lagrange points. Lagrange 2, for example, helps you communicate with the far side of the moon if you have a mission there. And China already has a presence there, right, on L2, Earth, Moon, Lagrange point 2. These are the stable points where you, if you, if you park a particular uh, satellite or a spacecraft, it will remain there. And so these are very strategically important. And so here you go, you can see the difference in terms of how even the value of the moon is conceptualized in different societies. Yeah, we also put usually telescopes if we can in the Lagrange points is definitely yes. a key point also for science research. Um, okay, we have 15 minutes before I pass the word to the questions. I have many questions for myself. Some of them, I want to keep them for the next episode when we're gonna explore the US and China in details. But before we close down, I want to bring the attention uh, on the present situation. We had two interesting political events in the past month. One was the 20th Chinese National Party Congress, and the other one was the Biden administration national security strategy, China versus US. Can we discuss a bit what came out? What are the implications of these two strategies? for space politics and the equilibrium that you were discussing before. We can start with the Chinese part if you want. Sure, so I think that's a great way to have an overall framing as well, which is what this episode is about, right? So what, what does it mean when you look at these two different documents? Or do, uh, for example, if I look at the document that was published, that is uh, President Xi Jinping's speech, right? Which is a two hour speech, it's translated into English, and then if you look at the US national security strategy. So uh, first of all, when, as I let's go back to how I frame the entire uh, conversation or how Emma also framed it for me, right? So we talked about geopolitics, what it means. We talked about what astropolitics means, which is the extension of a country's influence beyond Earth orbit to cislunar space and beyond. And we talked about how strategic culture, which means how elites perceive space, right? And that is where these two documents come in because President Xi Jinping is an elite in China. And then the document that was put out was a policy document from the United States. So this is how you compare it. So when I compare it and I did a content analysis of both to see uh, how many times space was actually uh, recognized and what was the different level. So President Xi, Xi's speech made it very clear that China's investment in strategic technologies, which included quantum stem cell research, uh, space biology, uh, lunar programs, as well as its Mars mission is within the concept of national rejuvenation, right? And he mentioned this about 29 times and repeated it again and again. So national rejuvenation is the idea that China based on President Xi Jinping's thought is going to become the greatest nation on earth by 2049. And all these strategic technologies play a key role. And so if you look at his specific paragraph on space missions, they included very ambitious missions. China's uh, lunar mission was articulated as key to China's conception of itself as a space power, China's mission to Mars, China's mission in terms of building the permanent station that has been completed in October, Tiangong, is very critical for China's conception as a space power. What President Xi did not talk about is how China is going to help in terms of building legal frameworks, for example, to do space traffic management, space domain awareness, uh, you know, talking about space debris management. And so I think why he omitted that is because those are means, they are not ends to China's space power, right? If you look at the US national security strategy, space was not a core idea. Cyber was. Cyber was included as a core concept in US national security thinking. Space was a subcomponent of cyber. 
And what was interesting to me is that in the paragraph where space was actually mentioned, it was all about creating responsible regulatory frameworks with regard to anti-satellite weapon testing, space domain awareness, space traffic management, and space situational awareness, right? Now think about it from the point of view of strategic culture and space power projection, right? Which speech or document do you think is going to inspire? I think in my perspective, the country with the much grander vision and doing missions to actually achieve it is going to inspire other nations to join in, right? And what President Xi also did, which is interesting, is that he included the concept of the Belt and Road Initiative Spatial Information Corridor. And he repeats this again and again, right? And whereas in the US national security strategy, you did not find such articulation, they talked about international partnerships, but it was not batting at the level where the Chinese president was batting, right? And I think that is where strategic culture, conception of space power, the narrative that you are forwarding becomes really important if you want to understand the difference and the comparative perspectives. In a sort of way, Europe is following a similar line of the US, developing more the legal framework rather than using space as a mean uh, for uh, the um, Devil for reaching this 2049 uh, achievement of becoming the biggest country in the world. Um, I'm looking some of my notes I took from the documents I read for the 20th Chinese Congress. Um, It's interesting, some of the articles I read, they brought Taiwan into the discussion and they say yeah. that um, Taiwan should be observed not under a military movement's point of view, but also from the point of view of potential Chinese-induced cyberspace attacks. Um, so it seems this is linking interesting to the strategic deterrence policy of China. Um, a sort of information cyber war attack, which might be the next step of China to obtain Taiwan. Uh, do you think this makes sense or is it just speculation? Uh, well, I think if you look at his speech, uh, he made it very clear that, and you know that it's China's position for a very long time, right? That they believe in the one China principle and it's different from the one China policy of the United States. So the United States one China policy is that there are two systems that exist and both of them have relevance, right? One, the Taiwan conception of being China and the other is China's conception. But the Chinese one China principle is that Taiwan is a core uh, component of Chinese territory and that this is what is the only narrative that matters. So those who equate and think that they are same actually is making a, making a mistake because then you would think that you at United States agrees with the Chinese position, right? But it does not. And so in that context, President Xi Jinping, what he has done, uh, and he's deviated from earlier colleagues, that he argues that very similar to what happened in Hong Kong, so with the national security law, that makes it very clear that, in so, and he used this term, he said that finally patriots are in power in Hong Kong, right? So you do not have this democracy, activists, and external influence. So with regard to Taiwan, he's made a claim that China is having all options on the table, including military. That's where space comes in, right? So if you look at the recent uh, People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force funded writings, and they are available as well online, they're translated into English. They argue that how space will matter is for, for example, when you are moving your naval forces uh, much more for the United States than for China. China is very close to Taiwan, right? But United States movement of forces, command control, missile tracking, navigation will depend on space support. And one of the ways that they are recognizing this is that when they look at how the United States has performed in say Ukraine with military support, right? So one of the ways the People's Liberation Army writing, Strategic Support Force funded writings are talking about is that very similar to Ukraine, where you have American private companies like Star, uh, SpaceX, Starlink, that offered uh, communication capability, and then uh, Maxar, which offered uh, real-time images of Russian deployment of forces. A similar situation can repeat in Taiwan. 
right? Where US private sector that has this very great communications infrastructure will support the deployment of uh, US forces. So in that context, they argue that the best way to counter US capability is to ensure that their space support system is vulnerable. So what plays into this? China has anti-satellite weapon capability. We know that they tested it in 2007. And you can use that kinetic ASAT to attack, for example, a Starlink constellation. Uh, you can blind, you can use laser. China is developing that capability. China also has a robotic arm capability that they have demonstrated. And every demonstration is to ensure that the United States response remains deterred in the Taiwan scenario. So it's very realistic when you think about how space as a force multiplier can become a vulnerability for the United States. And you see this in Russia, right? It's not uh, in Ukraine. It's not just nuclear weapons that is ensuring that the conflict does not escalate. Russia also tested an anti-satellite weapon uh, in the end of 2021. And I argue that the time that this is directly connected to a plausible Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it happened in February on February 24th, 2022, where Russia wanted to then demonstrate that they also have the capability to ensure that US, if US forces are deployed in Ukraine and depend on satellite support, Russia pointed out that they have the capability to counter that support, right? Now, if they do it, of course, there will be a US response. But don't forget, it is not very easy to replace your satellites, right? And Absolutely. secondly, right? And the other important thing, so many people argue that, okay, if China does uh, anti-satellite test that creates debris on low Earth orbit or Russia does it, it creates problems for their own satellite support, right? Because their own satellites, it will also be difficult for it to perform. But interestingly, we tend to forget that China is very close to Taiwan and can have Earth-based intel and surveillance and reconnaissance, and so is Russia. Russia is just across the border for Ukraine, whereas the United States is deploying forces outside of its realm of or its zone of uh, capability, right? And so that's how space comes in in a Taiwan scenario, very clearly. So uh, you you painted the picture of uh, uh, Asian countries moving and more uh, investing more and more on space as a means for security, defense and economical progress and power to sort of subvert and change the or economic order as it is now. Uh, US uh, that is um, trying to stay in power, of course. Um, so what is at stake here? If we can zoom out a bit and just a touch a bit from strictly space speaking, uh, what are we observing here? What could happen in 50 years time? Yes, absolutely. So I think what is at stake here is which value system is actually forwarded, right? So if you have a US-led space order, the value system that you would expect would be forwarded is a democratic representative order, right? Not just in space, but also on Earth. And you will have much more representation from a variety of communities, allied nations that are democratic, including Europe, which uh, some nations have joined into the Artemis program. And then what is even more important is that the United States um, can be actually held accountable, not just at the level of the United Nations, but also domestically for things that they might it might do wrong, right? We might despair, but uh, US press is very critical of some of US behavior externally, as well as there is this uh, back and forth, right? Now, if you have a China-Russia-led space order in the next 50 years, which means what China is attempting to do today is not just, so what, okay, so let me say this, why is it so interested in the economic development of space, right, and, and including it in its grand strategic thinking, which is the large level of state growth, right, where you have political, diplomatic, economic, military capability coming in. Because in the Chinese strategic culture thinking, the nation that has the most advanced economic capability will, by extension, have the most advanced military and space capability. You need to have money to fund the programs that you do. And so China is very clear in that particular perspective. So 
Today, China is articulating that it wants to extend the Communist Party of China's uh, political narrative through the Belt and Road Initiative uh, information uh, capability. It wants to argue that that is legitimate. It includes Russia in its conception of the future in space by 2049. Uh, Russia-China partnership is the key major partnership. And we also know that if you look at the voting behavior of both China and Russia at the level of the United Nations First Committee that is talking about responsible behavior in space, they both have voted against it. Ah. This is true. Uh, and, and so empirically, take empirical evidence of what is happening, right? They argue that they want to have a peaceful, responsible space order, but then it all depends on who is talking about it and which country is bringing it about, right? If it's the West that brings it about or India, they would say that, no, this is not the order we want, right? And so, which is fascinating. And so if you think about the China with Russia joining in as a junior strategic partner order, you're thinking about a one-party value system, you're thinking about a non-representative system, you're thinking about a system that does not have an independent judiciary, right? What does that mean? That means that if you have a dispute that breaks out, you are tied to a particular legal system that is not free and fair, right? And so we might despair a lot about democracies and their dysfunction, but at least it has an independent judiciary, no matter how imperfect it might be, it works and that you have individual rights, right? You cannot be just arrested for something and have no legal recourse. So that's the kind of, I think that is what is at stake in the next 20, 30 years. And my concern is that at the international systemic level, it seems like authoritarian countries are acting in a way that is uh, questioning the American-led world order, right? Russia's invasion of Ukraine, violates Article 2.4 of the UN Charter, and yet the United Nations Security Council, that is the only body that can invoke Chapter 7, which is threats to the peace and international security, is dysfunctional because Russia is a permanent member and can veto everything, right? The recent G20 summit statement was very interesting to me. They pointed out that uh, the G20 member nations pointed out that the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine is illegitimate, right? And should not have happened. But we need to go beyond these statements because this, what is at stake is which system is going to then dominate in terms of not just space, but international order. So a system of value and uh, a profound dramatic change in how we interpret democracy potentially, I can see. Uh, okay, that's uh, an important statement. This is where I wanted to lead the conversation. Uh, we will have way more time to discuss about China's Russian partnership. I'm going to take up some questions because I can already see there are several. Please keep them coming, okay? Don't be shy. It's your occasion to speak with Namrata. Okay, first question. At which point, Namrata, do you see the multinational convergence of the militarization of space as eventually leading to a point of conflict in order to globally achieving superiority? Great. So, uh, great question. Thank you for that. So, I do make a distinction between militarization and weaponization of space. So when I think about militarization, I think about if space as a domain is being utilized for military operations, missile uh, launches, missile by missile, I mean intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, or regional ballistic missiles, uh, nuclear weapon uh, based tipped missiles, it's already happening, right? You already have intercontinental ballistic missiles that traverse low earth orbit. China last year tested a hypersonic nuclear tip, supposedly, allegedly, missile that traversed low Earth orbit, right? And so, uh, so militarization of space, including military communications, command control, nuclear command control, is already happening. I think where my concern comes in is where if space gets weaponized, right? That if a country places a weapon, a conventional weapon, for example, along with a satellite that can target another satellite. That's when I think a conflict will break out in space, but also will have implications on Earth, right? And so let me make this uh, clear in terms of the regulation that exists today in terms of militarization and weaponization, right? 
There is nothing in the Outer Space Treaty that stops nations from using space for military ends. Uh, the only thing the Outer Space Treaty is very clear about is that no nation that has signed the Outer Space Treaty and ratified it, uh, and the Outer Space Treaty was signed and uh, brought into law in 1967, uh, so its base, basic premise is that you cannot place weapons of mass destruction in space. And by that, nuclear weapons and weapons that can have mass effect, right? The Outer Space Treaty does not stop nations from placing conventional weapons. And so if a nation wants to do an anti-satellite weapon test, there is nothing in the Outer Space Treaty that stops a nation from doing that. The only time the Outer Space Treaty will be invoked is if it is a nuclear anti-satellite test right if if that technology becomes possible so my that's my concern that if uh, country a uh, views space as so critical for access for example to its lunar base that exists and that access is somehow it views going to be denied it'll place a particular uh, platform in low earth orbit that has a weapon right and that could lead to conflict and i i see i see the possibility of that because if you think about the ambitions that countries have, they want to have a base on the moon by 2036. The US wants to have an Artemis base camp within that same period. India is articulating ambitions. Japan's iSpace wants to have a space settlement by 2040. Any denied access could lead to potential conflict. And we do not have the regulations and the consensus to ensure that this does not happen. Thank you, Namrat. I'm gonna take the question of Paul Paul, if you want, just post them us on the Q&A because I struggle a bit if you guys put them on the chat, but I can see your question. So Paul is asking, China is in decline, demographics losing out as the West resources, manufacturing, lack of energy security, et cetera. How can they spend massively on space in this context? Yeah, so I mean, there is this argument that China is on the decline or China is collapsing has been around for about 30 years, right? Uh, Gordon Chang wrote this very interesting book called The Coming Collapse of China 20 years ago, where he thought China would collapse in the next five years because of demographic, the one-child policy. As you know, China has reverted that policy. It does not have a one-child policy anymore, hoping that the next generation will have much more potential and skill. I think what is interesting to understand is that China earns a lot from foreign direct investment from exporting a lot of the goods that we use, including dominating supply chains, right? So China dominates in terms of rare earth metal, coal, space, solar power. It's a dominant actor. And by the way, it is able to spend that much in space because of the fact that it is earning a lot of money through its control of very critical supply chains. And now China has taken a policy statement that says that Innovation uh, strategy is going to be critical. By innovation, what China means is that you introduce technologies that do not exist. For example, you become a leader in space-based solar power, which China has a national program on. And so the and, and so this is critical to understand that they are anticipating what we think they're going to suffer from. And they are building into that mechanism. And they are also ensuring that their own societies do not get paranoid by these narratives that the West puts out, by controlling information flow, right? Under President Xi Jinping, that's a big, big strategy of controlling the information flow. And I would also argue that what is so interesting to me is that in regard to what they are building to achieve what they hope to in space, there are two ways that they, at least of now, seems to be showcasing some level of advantage, right? One is that the return for the dollar in China is much higher. Right. So uh, how do, why do I make this argument? Uh, China spends about $11 billion in its civilian space program. We do not know how much China spends on its military space program. There is no clear resource out there. The U.S. spends about $52 billion, right? Look at the difference in scale and investment. Then we have to also include the U.S. private sector, right? Where investments come not just from the government, but also from private investors. I think what people miss out is that to compare this and say they are equal misses out the fact that to manufacture a rocket in China is so much more cheaper than, say, manufacturing it in the U.S., right? 
to retain talent in China is cheaper, especially indigenous talent. And what China has also done in terms of its space program is that it has recognized space as a critical infrastructure in 2020, including satellite internet. So once you recognize a particular area as critical infrastructure, the funding, the uh, special status that is given to those working in this particular field becomes really critical. And so investment will flow, state investment will continue. And then China is also opening up its space sector for foreign direct investment, right? It is, it is uh, privatizing. Since 2014, China has privatized its space startups, including development of reusable rockets and small sets that they want to dominate, right? Now, having said that, I would, I would if I think about it from a more uh, wildcard perspective, right? There is, of course, that concern, which is the concern with the United States, which is the concern with India, which is the concern with Europe, that divisiveness in political culture will result in countries not being able to meet many of the goals that they have set out, right? Uh, there is a lot of division in the United States in terms of political belief, democracy, in terms of whether space is at all something that the US needs to invest in. There's a lot of questioning. There are some who call that the US should stop investing in any kind of uh, you know, future technologies very, very public, uh, powerful voices. And so China also has that kind of narrative, right? Not to the extent that is there in democratic nations. So I think in my perspective, the biggest wild card is if China is not able to retain and develop the skill set and talent required for some of the space ambitions that they have articulated, and uh, I will stop there because I know we have an episode on China and I can address that in much more detail uh, in that episode. Yes, so we're going to have a specific episode on China, which is why, Monica, I'm not going to take your question, which is very interesting. She's asking about the future of the Chinese Starlink uh, project, but it's very interesting. Keep it warm for the, in two episodes time, we will discuss about that. So um, keep coming back, come back, come back in a couple of months time. I'm going to take the question of Luca. She asked, what technologies are, in your opinion, the most sought after for space superiority? Which is interesting. Uh, can you repeat that question? I cannot see it here. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So she asked, uh, which technologies, in your opinion, are the most sought after for space superiority? Yes, sure. So uh, there are three technologies that are being uh, sought after today, right, for space superiority. One is the ability to sustain satellites and hardening them, and the ability for satellites to be refueled, which is still not a case, and to, 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 be, to be able to maneuver. So that's a technology that most countries are seeking uh, towards. The second technology that countries are seeking towards is autonomous manufacturing in situ resource utilization. And this is where uh, countries are investing in key technologies like artificial intelligence, enable robotics, and ability to do 3D printing, for example, in space, and the ability to manufacture structures without the human beings involved in space itself. Because don't forget, the space environment is also very hard and human bodies are still not adapted to function there efficiently. So if you really want to enable human capability to go to space, you need to have all that capability. That kind of capability also has impact on your national security because if you're able to manufacture satellites autonomously and rebuild them, cost is low. And then you can also replace your aging streams of satellite. The final technology that nations are really looking towards in terms of maintaining space superiority is to invest in a space logistics system that would include the whole chain. It would include a presence in low Earth orbit, which is permanent. It would include presence in cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon and then the ability to use that particular presence to extend out. So, which means the nation that is able to have space cislunar situational awareness is able to track objects from the moon cislunar space in geosynchronous orbit and low earth orbit. The nation that is able to extend itself, for example, out to Mars will have space superiority. And I'll end by saying that uh, my colleague at Air University, Dr. Dolman, has a really interesting map. 
as to how he maps it. He argues that the nation that is going to dominate low earth technology and access will have space superiority. So the nation that is able to do that and is able to extend it for a very long time will be able to have a uh, space superiority. Namrata, thank you. If we have another minute, I want to take a last question. There is many questions. Uh, of the, there is also a debate on satellites, so whether they can be considered weapons or not. But I'm going to uh, jump to Catherine's last question. And she asks, uh, what impact uh, will the growing commercialization of space have for the sustainability of the space environment? With more economic skin in the game, will that temper bellicose tendencies and encourage progress on multilateral agreement to develop, enables, such as global space traffic management systems? What's your opinion about this? Oh, great question. I just had a panel on that yesterday uh, with uh, the Indo-Pacific Forum. So uh, I think uh, what I've noticed and I've seen develop is that with the growing commercialization of space, which means the growing privatization of space, there is actually a push for better regulatory mechanisms because don't forget when, suppose I'm an investor, right? The most important thing for me is that I am investing this much money. I am taking a risk. I need a return. I need profit from it, right? And without regulatory mechanisms, I might end up in trouble, right? So they are pushing for regulatory mechanisms for more responsible behavior. There is a lot of conversation about developing technologies to clean up low Earth orbit, right? So what I noticed with the entry of the commercial space sector is that because they are so much motivated by profit, uh, which I know sometimes you find uncomfortable, right? Because profit is what they are aimed at. But that's how the commercialization of space really is about, right? And so it's about sustainability, but also because to ensure that access is maintained, space remains clean, and that uh, such commercial activities can go on without being deterred, right? And so I will I will show you this, how it happens empirically, right? So this is what commercial actors are doing all across the world. You would find uh, one of the websites that I find very interesting is a, is a website called Sat Search that is developed by the Indian new space companies. And most of the conversation coming out of the Indian new space actors is that how do we ensure that space remains accessible and that nations behave responsibly so that we do not end up in a scenario where space becomes so inaccessible that it, we lose access, right? And so I'll finally end by saying that even with regard to space resource utilization, the very fact that the United States passed the Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act in 2015 was because the US private sector pushed for it. They pushed for such regulation for responsibly acting in space. Amrata, thanks a lot. There are many other questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, you will receive uh, a, um, a message from us. And, uh, and uh, Catherine is asking if you can share a link to the, that website. Uh, Catherine, uh, I'm asking, I'm passing the question to Namrata. I think you can see it in the, in the, in the chat, Namrata. Yes, I will, I will send the link to the to the set search. You can just set your set search. That's the word you use and put India it will come up. Fantastic, thank you. So um, please uh, share with us your feedbacks. So let us know if you like this format, if you find interesting, if you want to see something more developed. We are open to suggestion. It's something that we are creating for you. And uh, so when you will receive the thank you email, send us some feedbacks, let us know how we're going, what you would like to see, because obviously this is a dialogue. As you can see, the questions are many, there is a lot of, um, inputs and we would love to collect all the inputs and be able to elaborate on them so be interactive and let us know uh, what would you like to see and uh, um, so by for now i would like to sincerely thank namrata for the incredible discussion we had i didn't even notice the 60 minutes gone i think everyone was very interactive it was a pleasure um we will see each other i think in a couple of months time the next episode is on the us so we will have uh, the occasion to develop some of the topics, uh, some of the seeds uh, you distributed today. And uh, also let me thanks all the audience and Elena Vocale for being the fantastic uh, event manager and obviously Torsten and all the people behind the production that are usually are assisting me in uh, 
putting together the show. Thank you very much. Namrata, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great questions. I wish I could answer all of them. So next time we're gonna because they they're shy. They don't tell me that there are the questions, so I don't see them. And then suddenly there are like 20 questions. <laughs> don't be shy, just interact. You know, we can modulate the, the discussion as uh, as is better for everyone. And let me pass the word to Elena for that will uh, show you the next events. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Yes, thank you, Emma and Namrata. Before we say goodbye, let me remind you of our upcoming events. So in two days, on Thursday the 24th uh, at 9.30 a.m. in Central Europe and 7.30 in uh, p.m. in Eastern Australia, we have our Space Café Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland. In this episode, he will welcome Olga Volinskaya and Lucien Rapp at the virtual version at the, of the Magnificent Café Le Biban in Toulouse. Uh, to discuss many legal issues arising from everyday space activities. And later on that same day, on the 24th, again at 4 p.m. Central Europe, we have our Space Café Scotland by Angela Matisse on the Sustainable Space Strategy for Scotland. On the 28th um, of November at 2 p.m., we're hosting the next Space Café Space Arbitration uh, Association event on the question, can we arbitrate harmful interference disputes? On the 29th, um, always November at 4 p.m. in Central Europe, join our Space Cafe 33 Minutes with Marco Ferrazzani on the outcomes of the ASA Ministerial meeting. And on the 30th of November at 4 p.m. Central European times, Join our Space Cafe Italy by Dr. Emma Gatti uh, in a conversation with nobody else than the president of the Italian Space Agency, Giorgio Saccoccia. On the 1st of December at 8 p.m., we have, we're uh, joining the Space Bar, uh, the 59th Space Bar um, by Astro Agency. And on the 16th of the 6th, uh, sorry, of December at 4 p.m., we're going to have our Space Cafe 33 minutes live from Scotland. And finally, on the 8th of December at 5 p.m., we're going to have our Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grosner. All events, as always, are going to be online on Eventbrite and for you to keep track of them. And we would like to hear your feedback. Uh, so please check in on with us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. And don't forget to sign up for our daily and bi-weekly newsletters. And if you'd like to treat yourselves to something special, become a space watcher today or help us in the support your program. Grazie mille to Emma and Amrata again for the inspiring talk and for being our guests tonight. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing that great job week by week again. I hope you will all stay safe and healthy. And thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next week in the coming events. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Bye. Thank you.